In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If you had lived a hundred years ago, one of your heroes might have been a man widely known as Bula Matari. His English name was Henry M. Stanley, and he was one of the greatest explorers of Africa and went into that dark continent to find David Livingston, that great missionary of the cross, when he had not been heard from for several years. Stanley made other extended trips into Africa. The heart of Africa and was the one man best known for opening up that large section of Central Africa, now known as Zaire. Henry Stanley was a deeply religious man. He tells in his books how his ability to pray saved him time and time again from total despair. He tells how he read the Bible every day before turning in. He tells of his religious convictions and how they were the key to his entire life. However, Stanley experienced a very unhappy childhood and youth. He grew up in a very poor home where he was cruelly mistreated. When he ran away, he had to work hard just to eat. Whenever relatives did help him, they did so grudgingly. And finally, he worked his way to the United States where he found a friendly father, only to lose him tragically. He fought in the Civil War on both sides. And then he became a newspaper correspondent. It was while he was working for the New York Times that he was given the assignment to go into Africa and find David Livingston. And he did this in the year 1871, after tremendous difficulties. But when he reported his success to the world, there were people who said it was just a hoax. He had lied. This hurt him deeply. And even though time proved his honesty, he really never got over his hurt. In his autobiography, he writes these words. But when I emerged from childhood and learned by experience that there was no love for me, born, so to say, fatherless, spurned and disowned by my mother, beaten almost to death by my teacher and guardian, fed on the bread of bitterness, how was I to believe in love? We have all asked that question at one time or another in our lives. How am I to believe in love? Where am I to find love? The answer to all such questions can be found in our text this morning taken from John's epistle, which is stated in simplicity and with all profundity when he writes, God is love. Find God then and you have found love, for love is God personified. Love is the quintessential attribute of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the psalmists, the prophets, the apostles, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how should we define love? I go back to the systematic theologian I studied more than 40 years ago in the seminary for a suggestion. Negatively, he reminds us, the love of God is not some sentimental, emotional affection. You all know the three Greek words for love. Eros, which describes the physical attraction between men and women. Philos, which describes that emotional affection we have one for another and is best thought of in terms of brotherly love. And then there is the word agape, which is used here by John in his letter. God is agape. Archbishop Trench, the great theologian and linguist, claims this word agape appears nowhere else in all of the literature of the ancient world. It was born in the bosom of the Christian faith it is unique to the New Testament. Also, and again negatively, the love of God, while it is the quintessential attribute of God, it does not exclude his holiness and his justice. God always takes sin very seriously. And so holiness and justice always condition God's love, and love always conditions God's holiness and his justice for God does not deny himself. Holiness and love and justice always go together in God. Positively, the love of God is something rational, something voluntary, something which communicates itself to humankind, and something which does not deny itself by deviation 
from the character and all of the attributes of God. So what is the love of God like? John tells us in this beautiful epistle, he writes, this is how God showed his love for us. He sent his only son into the world that we might have life through him. The love of God tells the story of a father who had an only son, high in his esteem, equal in power and glory and majesty with himself. And from eternity before time ever began, they saw their creation humankind. They saw humanity's fallen condition, saw that sin had marred the Imago Dei, the image of God. They saw the helplessness and the hopelessness of their condition and how they were enslaved by a force more powerful than their unaided ability to extricate themselves. It is the story how in great compassion and love the Father sends his Son to planet Earth into our human environment in human form and likeness, and then the Son ministered to humanity's deepest soul needs. It is the story of the sinless representative of heaven being rejected and despised and hated by the very people who were the objects of his commiseration. It is the story of a solitary figure arraigned before the courts of so-called justice. No one spoke on his behalf. Indeed, he did not defend himself. It is the story of a young man who is condemned to die for no crime he ever could have committed. It is the story of a young man bent low beneath the weight of a heavy wooden cross, trudging and dragging himself up the long Golgotha hill outside the walls of Jerusalem. And it is the story of agonizing hours under the scorching heat of a tropical noonday sun. It is the story of darkness and suffering and blood and sweat. And at the very height of this terrible ordeal, amid the torture and pain of both body and soul, the father turns his back upon the son and the son cries out in those poignant words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken? Yes, forsaken because he who knew no sin became sin for us. And the punishment for sin is always forsakenness by a God who is just, a God who is holy, but a God who is also love. And so despised, mistreated, rejected, and alone, the Son dies bearing your sin and mine in his body on the cross. Ask me to define the love of God. Well, there it is on the cross, giving and giving and giving all that it has to give for your redemption and mine. There is no thought of love holding back of anything, of suffering, of shame, of reproach. On the contrary, the love of God this quintessential attribute of God doesn't count the cost until it is given and given and given and given everything for our redemption. This is the love of God. One final consideration, what are the achievements of this wonderful love? I suggest three. First, its reach is universal. God's love reaches to all people everywhere in space and in time and in every condition. Today, no matter who you are, no matter what you are, no matter what your condition may be, you are not beyond the reach of God's love. Henry M. Stanley actually made two hazardous trips in, into Central Africa. Sometime after he found David Livingston, he was called upon to lead an expedition into that dark continent to rescue a German adventurer who was working for the Egyptian government under the name of Eman Pasha. Eman Pasha had been forced to flee into the heart of Africa after a revolt by some of the Muslim fanatics in the Sudan. Eman Pasha called for help, and this large expedition under Henry M. Stanley made a frightful trip through terrible jungles and swamps. And just 100 years ago this year, in the year 1889, Neiman Pasha was brought out to safety. But Stanley always looked upon that experience with distaste and disgust. The reason? Neiman Pasha in almost every way was the opposite of the great David Livingston. Stanley Frank frankly came to feel that Neiman Pasha wasn't worth saving. 
How different from the love of God. The love of God says that all people are worth saving. There is none too vile, too contemptible, too loathsome, too far gone into depravity that God's love does not look for that one. The love of God is no respecter of persons. It embraces all people everywhere, all races and nationalities and tribes and tongues, the rich, the poor, the sick, the well, the intelligent, the slow of wit, everybody. Love's God is meant for all. The second achievement of love is that it purchased for us eternal life. Indeed, the love of God will not rest until our restless souls find rest in him. O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee, I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. The third achievement of love, the love of God is this, because God loves us so much, that love makes it possible for us to love each other. Dear friends, John writes in his letter, let us love one another for love comes from God. And this point is so important to John that he repeats himself, saying, dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Francis of Assisi is one of my favorite saints. He was absolutely terrified of lepers and leprosy. Wouldn't you know, one day he was walking down a narrow path when suddenly he stood face to face with a leper. The leper was horribly white and ashen in the bright sunlight. And instinctively he recoiled from that man. He shrank back from being contaminated by that very loathsome disease. And then the love of God, which was a part of that saint, rallied his spirit. And absolutely ashamed of himself, he ran up to the leper and threw his arms around him and kissed him. And then went on down the path. A moment later, he looked back on the path, and there was no one there, only the empty path. For the rest of his life, Francis of Assisi was sure that that was no leper on the path, rather it was none other than the risen living Jesus Christ whom he had met. But he was willing to love even someone unlovely for whom he was terribly afraid. Robert Munch has written a children's storybook entitled Love You Forever. It is the beautiful story about loving God and loving each other and loving ourselves. A mother held her newborn baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth. And as she rocked him, she sang, I will love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. But that baby grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was two years old and he ran all over the house and he pulled the books off the shelf and the food out of the refrigerator and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when the two-year-old was quiet, she opened his door, crawled across the room, and looked up over the bed. And if he was really asleep, she picked him up in her arms and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The little boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old. He never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath. And when grandma visited, he said bad words. Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at nighttime when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened his door of his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. And he had strange friends and he wore strange clothes and he listened to strange music. And sometimes the mother felt that she was in the zoo. 
But at night when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that teenager grew, he grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town. But sometimes on dark nights, the mother got into her car and drove across town. And if all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened the bedroom window, crawled across the floor, looked up over the bed. And if he was really asleep, she picked up that great big man and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby will be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. And one day she called up her son and said, you'd better come and see me because I'm very old and very sick. So her son came to see her, and when he came to the door, she tried to sing her song, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. But she couldn't finish, she was too old, she was too sick. And so the son went to his mother, and he picked her up and rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as he rocked her, he sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. When the son came home that night, he stood for a long time at the stop, top of the stairs, and then he went into the room where his new baby daughter was sleeping, and he picked her up in his arms and slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as he rocked her, he sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my daughter you'll be. Friends, to love as God loves us means, it may mean getting up at four in the morning, and going down to the bus station and ministering to a homeless person or serving soup to a hungry man at the soup door kitchen or giving comfort to someone suffering from AIDS who is dying and afraid and alone or helping a single parent who is having a hard hard time making ends meet or a wealthy person isolated behind his desk in a tall building downtown or a drug addict who is trying to squeeze out of life one more ounce of pleasure to a aching body. You see, God loves everybody, and so should we. Therefore, Jesus said, Inasmuch as you've done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in that person. So I pray that there will be much love flow between pastors and people of this wonderful congregation, between pastors and pastors and between members of congregation and members of congregation, so that the world may know that God loves us. And because he loves us, we are to love one another. May God bless all of you in this great church. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.